Welcome, everyone. This is Joe Dagger, the host of the Business Dino One podcast. With me today is John Latham. John is the founder of the Organizational Design Studio, which is a digital learning center and application lab for organization architects. His passion is creating frameworks that build bridges between theory and practice to help designers build and transform organizations that create sustainable value. He can be found at organizational design stu- or organizationdesignstudio.com, which includes a robust side design for learning. John, I guess the best place to start is thanks for being here and tell us about that organization design community. Well, th- thanks, Joe. It's, it's great to be here. I love your podcast and it's just an honor to be invited. Organization design community is an, an interesting group because um it's it people that use those words organization design it's kind of a fragmented group there's all kinds of people involved and and it's not really well structured and well defined and and i think part of part of the issue is that um it's cross disciplinary and so anytime you have some a topic that's cross disciplinary and involves a lot of different things in an organization there there's very few real formal tracks so the the community is really a collection of leaders who are trying to change the systems in their organization or their organization and frontline process improvement people who are redesigning some piece of the organization so it includes them all plus a whole lot of subject matter experts and consultants that help leaders cha- make the changes necessary. So it's it's a crazy crazy landscape and uh, includes just a whole lot of different people uh, in it. I have to tell you I I mean you have several free books on your website and including the leadership framework for organization architects. But uh, I have to say, okay, and I I tweeted this out the other week is I was really disappointed when I downloaded it because you should be making people pay for this stuff. This is this is pretty good stuff. <laughs> well, I thank you, Joe. I, I'm glad you found value in it, and I hope other people find value in it. Uh, it's really it's really a great observation, and and I have to tell you, you're not the first one to ask me this question. What's on the website? I hope is the essentials or the fundamentals. Um, we are work. You know, I am working on other digital products and experiences that'll take people further. And we're going to, we are, you know, believe it or not, the studio is a, is a for-profit company. So we are going to have to charge for some things, but, but we want to, you know, we have a vision of a world where all the leaders have the knowledge, skills, abilities that they need to, to reimagine and reinvent and recreate, you know, their organization or a piece of their organization. And so that it creates value for multiple stakeholders as opposed to taking from one and giving to another one. So we, I, the word we use is sustainable excellence and trying to achieve sustainable excellence. So we view our job as, as to provide tools, techniques, technologies to help with that, that journey. But we wanted everybody to have the fundamentals and those fundamentals People have been generous with me and the research we've done and the work we've done over the last 25 years. And so I I just wanted to share the essence and the fundamentals of of what it is we're about and what the process is about. And that way people can decide for themselves whether this is something they'd like to pursue and go further and in in the process. Well, is this framework, what was this framework built upon? I mean, what's the crux of this framework? So there's there's two frameworks that one and one is embedded in the other. So there's a leadership framework that we you know we call the leadership framework for organization architects, just so that it differentiates it from all the other leadership frameworks. Um, but it, the leadership framework really um, took shape. It's 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 the culmination of many years, a couple of decades worth of work. But it really took shape when I conducted a research study with CEOs who led. Uh, successful transformations resulting in a Baldridge Award. And I chose that group because the uh, the Baldridge uh, criteria requires that they create ever-improving results across a comprehensive scorecard. So they can't be great just based on financials or they can't be great just based on a great place to work or whatever. They have to be able to create a place that, that people are doing great work and, and enjoying their job, serving customers, Customers are delighted, so they come back and spend more money with us, repeat business. They bring their friends, referral business, 
and we grow the top line and the investors are happy. And, and we also create win-wins with suppliers that help us do even, an even better job with, with customers. And then we do this in a way that the community loves to have us because we're doing it in a way that's you know conscious of the community and society we're in and ethical. And we're doing it in a way that's good for the natural environment, which is really the future generations. And so we avoid stealing from future generations. So that's why I chose the Baldridge Group. and and we studied CEOs and how they led their transformation over the protracted period of time because most of their journeys took, you know, five to 10 years sometimes to fully transform a company. And they made progress and got results along the way, but the full transformation took a while. Well, we studied them and we talked to them and inductively built a framework that was common to them, that had the common elements that they used to lead the journey. And so that's that's the genesis of it. It came from that. And then we've infused it with all the application experience that we've had over the years. And now we continue to develop it and refine the application of it. Well, I have to ask you, because I always remember Tom Peters' books from years ago, and I, I, off the top of my head, I forget the name of it, okay, where he picked out the 10 most successful companies or 10 successful companies or might have been the art of corporate success or something. I, I, I don't remember. In, in Search of Excellence. In I Search think. of Excellence, yes. You go back and you look at them, and a lot of them companies aren't excellent anymore, all right? Is that true with the with the Baldridge? Have those companies pretty much sustained? Is there a higher level of sustainability in them? Do you know? Yeah, well, I do. I, we do know there is a higher level of sustainability. It there's been a few cases that are did they didn't do so well after winning the award and weren't able to sustain it. In those cases, when you dig into them, it was almost something was explainable from an external environment perspective. Um, and so Baldridge Award companies are really great at learning. They're really great at making the system work and getting it all lined up and high performing. But it, it's not a panacea for external factors that, you know, you don't predict. And while Baldridge companies that are doing it well are be often better at predicting what's going on in the external environment, there's some that still get surprised and things happen that are out of their, beyond their control that have, have made them lose, lose track. So there's one group, a very small group of a few sensational cases where major market factors, they, they declined in performance. There's, there's another group that leadership changed and they stopped pursuing excellence as a conscious effort. In other words, they had these great systems in place, but they stopped pursuing it and creating new goals, and they took their eye off the ball, if you will. And those organizations tended to level off and or decline because you stop pushing the organization to move forward and entropy takes over and it, and it declines. And so it requires, to stay there requires continual learning. Well, the, the majority of Baldridge organizations that I'm familiar with have built learning loops into their systems. And so it became part of not only their systems, but their culture. And that became something that they continued on because the world changes on us. So there's no point where we can say, okay, we know the answer of how this company should run and we're done, right? So a design is never finished. We're always rethinking the design of the company and reinventing it because the world around us is changing. And, and in fact, it, we're, we're facing a really big shift these days with the whole digital uh, aspect of business and what possible, you know, which creates great possibilities for us, but also creates great challenges for organizations. And if we're not redesigning to take advantage of the technology, you can bet our competitors are. So it's a continuous thing. So all of them haven't um, uh, continued. Baldridge is not perfect and it's not a panacea. It's a great set of questions to help you learn. But if you take your eye off the ball and stop using it to learn, you're going to experience the same kind of decline anybody else would. So there, Baldridge organizations aren't bulletproof. They're just good role models and, you, and they're role, companies we can learn from. And they're companies that are doing it in a way that creates a, a balanced set of results. So they're not just taking from one to make something else happen for a short term period of time, which is not sustainable in the just keep it going sense of the word. 
Well, you know, I'm going to jump into something that I was going to wait till the end, but this is kind of a nice segue into it is because we talk about this description of creative tension in your book. And, you know, and here we are talking about not taking our eye off the ball and, and how do we continue with excellence. And I think creative tension has some merit to that whole thought process. And could you kind of start out, though you wait till the end of the book to put it in there, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really it, at the beginning, either beginning of your book, somewhat. Okay, so it, tell you tell it, let's explain what creative tension is. Yeah, Joe. Actually, Joe, it's 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 in both places. It's actually the bookends um, because yeah. step, step one, the forces for change, are you know what is pushing us. So whether we call it creative tension or structural tension, as some of your listeners may be familiar with, uh, regardless, it's it it's tension that causes us to change. So we need tension to overcome inertia, right? A static, the inertia of status quo will stop us from changing anything unless we have enough force to overcome it. So part of the force that overcomes it are these dissatisfaction with the status quo, the things pushing us to, to change. A lot of the change leadership um, books talk about it as a burning flat form. I think John Cotter's, that was the term he used. And, and it's an essential piece, um, but a burning platform alone, like poor customer, bad financials, you know, regulation that's coming down, on things that are making us unsatisfied, they, they often tell us that we're not happy, but they don't tell us which way to go to fix it. And so the other side of tension is the pulling side, which is the vision. Where do we want to go? What is the desired reality versus the current reality? And that's a pulling tension and the combination between the pulling forces of the new the new uh, place that we want to get to the new reality and the pushing forces our dissatisfaction with where we currently are has to be greater than the inertia that's keeping us from moving at all and and a guy named Richard Beckhart came up with a formula and popularized it, it and uh, the origins of that formula are actually uh, sketchy, but he basically said that those two things have to be greater than the resistance to change, which is the status quo. And so not only do you have to have that in the beginning to get going, and so that that's step one is to understand the forces for change. And if you don't have enough forces for change, you need to create some dissatisfaction and or a better, more compelling vision so that you do have the forces for change. Otherwise, you're not going to go anywhere. Well, once you, have, once you get going and you're doing all these things, you start improving. So the dissatisfaction um, goes down because now we're doing better along as we start improving the pieces and parts and putting all this together and making it work as a system. And, and so once we start improving, the tension decreases. When the tension decreases, we, we now no longer have uh, enough to overcome inertia sometimes. So at the, the, the end of the book, which is where I talk about uh, maintaining the tension is is critical to keeping the organization moving because as soon as they're satisfied with where they are you know all progress stops pretty much unfortunately the world continues the world continues changing if we're happy with where we are we're going to get behind and uh, and start declining in performance so so I, it's a great point and it's really the book ends because without it everything else all bets are off there you know all other points are moot uh, if you so so when i read the book i will be in constant tension the whole time through right <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have to tell you that that this is a really tough sales pitch you, you know you're if you're not unhappy with your organization you have to become unhappy <laughs> and and that's not you know what most people want to hear they want to hear how do i become happy and uh and of course, this is the recipe for becoming happy, but it, it's not a quick fix. I, I, I think the, the, another key aspect is the ones that have done this well and continued on and continue to improve and redesign and, you know, so that their organization is relevant to the current uh, um, market and the current environment. Those are organizations that they take a certain amount of pride in their organization and their accomplishments and, and they're satisfied and they feel fulfilled with what they've accomplished. And at the very same time, they're not completely satisfied and they still know there's things to be done and they want to go do those things. So they're, they're happy with what they've done and they look forward to the future, but they're always living and working new things in the present. 
And I think you emulate what you're talking about so the Toyota Kata so well by Rother. Okay, and and the lean listeners will understand this, and that and how Mike tries to explain tension and uh, um, steps. Okay, of the kata of how to get from current state to future state, and I I, I think this is a very similar type of concept. And not for you to explain the you know try to explain kata or anything like that and everything, but there seems to be a lot of similarities over very popular and very useful organizational development methods okay do you see that in your work yeah that's a great insight joe and and, um i i think what we we see is oftentimes uh, the scientific method is at the core of almost all the effective learning models i know of and then when you couple that with uh, other creative type processes that like design thinking and things like that, they often can form a very complementary combination. Uh, I, I think scientific thinking, so often we have thought about it from a natural science experimentation perspective, which has a very deductive look and feel to it. Come up with a hypothesis, you test it, you find out how the world works. Well, that the scientific method actually doesn't keep you in there it doesn't it doesn't force you to be deductive but it does force you to test the ideas right which is a pretty darn important to validate stuff what it what it often we forget to to emphasize is how do you come up with the hypothesis how do you create that new solution that we think is going to work really well and that's where i think some of the more the other concepts and tools and techniques from design thinking and system thinking and things like that can be infused and used to come up with with better designs. I think one of the big issues that we face with organizations is they really aren't the natural world, the natural environment. Some of the pieces and parts within organizations are the natural world and follow some immutable natural laws of science. But you have all these people that, that seem to come in infinite variety and and don't obey the immutable natural laws of science all the time and and then you put them in groups and so the permutations are endless and so organizations which which some people would say really don't exist but the organizations as we define them today we created those we're humans we created these organizations we designed them so what when we're applying scientific methods to that we're applying it to something that doesn't exist in nature it, it's something we created. So we're evaluating and gaining insights into what our own creations and how humans react to those creations. And, and so what we're the re, when we apply the scientific method, we're really trying to gain insights to the organization so that we can recreate it. We can reimagine it. We say, this isn't working exactly like we thought it should work. Let's, let's come up with a better idea informed by, turbocharged by our scientific method and then test it again and see what we get. And so that whole learning loop of coming up with better ideas, testing them, and then learning from them, I think is just in the DNA of so many of the great and working improvement uh, programs that we have and use effectively in organizations. So, you know, and I think this is the Toyota lays this out and all this lean stuff about Toyota. And I talk about them because it's most familiar uh, with them. But with all this stuff, everybody, you know, Toyota knows they can't be copied because just as you mentioned, organizations are all different. Right. And it's the ability to take that information and take some lessons and make them your own that makes it successful. Right. Right. In the design framework, which is embedded in the leadership framework, but it's a separate fr- framework on how to design management systems or organization systems. There, one of the steps in the framework, one of the pieces, I, I've labeled it inspiring examples for the very reason you're talking about is that we can learn from others, we can be inspired by others, but if we don't creatively adapt that and create our own custom solution, at best, we're going to be followers to our competitors. At worst, we're going to implement things that simply aren't going to work in our organization. And the examples of that are, are legion. I mean, we've got lots of examples where people copied stuff from one culture context, put it in another company culture context, and it failed miserably. And they blamed the tool when, in fact, it was the, the people implementing that tool in 
you know, and not without creatively adapting it. That was the problem. So I, it is a double-edged sword, but, you know, it's, it, you can be inspired by other organizations, but if, if you're just copying, that's, that's not the same as being inspired to create your own design. That's, that's copying and, and uh, you know, at best you're going to be following the other people. Well, I, I, I'll take this really down to the, the most lowest level of just about, okay, versus organizational talking here, is I always get I always get a kick out of, let's say, process mapping software or mind mapping software, okay, or even marketing plan software. The ability to sell that is based on the templates and plans that you have created already. <laughs> and really, you can't use someone else's marketing plan, but that's the idea that if I go out and... You know, I buy the software that got five different plumbers plans in it that I can I can I can have a good marketing plan for a plumber. OK, right. And it's not even at that level. Is it true? And that's I mean, that's a that's a great example. And I think the you know what I would I attempt to do is provide enough structure and to bound and frame thinking, which is why I call them frameworks, flexible frameworks, not a model with not a prescriptive model, but a framework to help organize your own thinking around the custom design and solution for your organization. Because, you know, every organization is different. Some are different in a good way and some are different and, and need to be redone because they're toxic. But, but every organization is unique. And the, you know, there's a lot of things we can copy. Healthcare, for example, has made great strides by sharing with each other, because the process, the the transfer of knowledge between you know one surgery procedure and another, is not that great as if you're learning from people outside your industry. But again, it 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 levels you know all the organizations, and and few are going beyond that or using that process to go beyond it because they learn from each other and they all end up being at the same plane. Well. For healthcare and for us in healthcare, we want that, right? So there is a certain amount of goodness in that, and I don't want to, you know, say, you know, be guilty of hyperbole and saying that's not useful. It's very useful, but it it's not going to reinvent us and take us to the next level. So somebody's got to be doing that work that takes us to the next level that the rest of us can learn from. But if you're just learning from it and copying, again, you're, you're going to follow. And, and that may be OK. Maybe that's what you want to do. But um, if you want to if you want to lead and want to create something new, then then you've got to to take some risk and break some molds and, and come up with some different solutions and test them. And and I, I think one of the biggest issues we face in our companies today is that we really don't want to take risk. We say we want innovation. But yet we've got an entire system set up to where you have to have predictable results before anybody else spend any time or money on it. Well, if you've got predictable results, I would contend that you're not doing anything innovative. Because if we can predict the results, we already know the answer. It's not new. And so the only time you're doing innovation is when you are doing things that you really don't know. You may have an educated guess, and you, but you really don't know what the result is going to be and how successful it's going to be. You know, otherwise it, it it wouldn't be innovation. But well, you have fourteen steps in the in your book, okay? <laughs> and I I mean, do you have to use them all, or they you know step by step by step you have to go? How does someone get started in that? <laughs> it's a great question, Joe, and I've I've got several answers. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, uh, it it they they're flexible frameworks, but we have organized organized them into fourteen sequence steps. To, to say that that's actually how it plays out is, is, is not, the, that's really not the case. But that is a logical way to learn about them and a, even a logical way to do them if it's the first time you're going through that, that process. And, and in fact, we just went live with more free stuff. Um, we, we created a whole new section on the website and went live two days ago, really, uh, called Blueprints. And it's in the main menu of our website. It's free when you sign up for the free eBooks. There's four free eBooks. You also get this free blueprints. This blueprints takes takes the content from the eBooks and organizes it into those 14 steps. Puts it online in a different way that's searchable and linked and all that. Those 14 steps are a logical way to explore, certainly for the first time. 
But if you're already in the middle of a transformation, you're already using these kinds of tools, you may enter this and say, hey, I need help here. And then you jump to wherever you need help. So it's a framework that you can enter and exit at any point. But there is a logical sequence for those that are that are starting out. The other part of your question was, do you have to do it all? Well, here's the deal. I, I don't really know. But what I do know is the organizations that have been successful and sustained these gains and, and actually accomplished and achieved sustainable excellence, they do them all. <laughs> so you, you might find examples where one, they didn't do one thing or not one thing well. There's no perfect ones, right? But the reason those elements are there is because there was a high level of consensus across the organizations that have a- accomplished this. And, and that's the only reason it stayed in the model. I have to tell you, the, I, I wanted a much simpler model. Most everybody that looks at it says, hey, you got a lot of stuff here. I'm like, yes, we do. We, we could figure out a way to make it simpler. We would, because our, our goal wasn't to make it complex. But when we test, we, we've gone through a process of testing every element. Should it stay? Should it go? Is it essential? And at the end of the day, the case was it's, it's pretty much essential. The question is, you don't have to do all 14 at one time. You don't have to remember all 14. A lot of the steps are things that you would systematize, write down, and they're activities that you would do in a systematic way. It's not something you have to remember. And, and what needs to get embedded if you, are the new ways the leader behaves and their leadership style and the culture of the organization. And to get there, the best way to do that is for the leader to personally transform. And, and that's really the way to be authentic is to grow and learn themselves. And I think one of the things that all the leaders I've talked to that have success, led successful transformations experience was a personal learning experience. They changed from the beginning to the end. Yeah, the grooves got deeper, the gray matter got grayer, they were different people at the end and they continued to be different people. And that wasn't just a role modeling thing, although that's important. You got it, the leaders have to role model what they want to see in the rest of the organization. But it also kept them going because to reinvent their own organization, they had to learn new things and, and learn how to, you know, how to think about new things in different ways and test their assumptions. So they had to be in a little bit of attention themselves, right? Uh, absolutely and and the one <laughs> the ones that that um didn't already know that found out along the way uh, there's there's one ceo that they, they had been at this for about a year or so trying to transform and this their senior team only about half of them were really doing it and and he and he talked to his you know i call them spies but you know informants said hey find out what's going on why why aren't they doing this and they came back and they and they said well boss the answer is They'll change when the CEO changes. <laughs> and, and he was like, oh. <laughs> and and he, he was a kind of guy that, you know, stepped back and reflected on that. He didn't like that answer. But when he thought about it, he, he thought, you know, I'm a product of this company. I've been there over 20 years. I'm embedded in it. I'm part of the, you know, culture that the current culture, not the one we want. He goes, you know, I really hadn't thought through what I'm going to have to do to emulate and, and set the example. And so once he changed his approach, and then he started getting the senior leaders on board because he now had credibility and he was serious. We, we launch all these change projects and we create visions and we say we want these kind of values, but people are pretty smart. They watch, your beha- watch our behavior and they figure out what the real values are and what you really think is important by our behavior. And so it's great to write these things down. It's important to write them down. It's important to, to, to design all this and figure it out. But if the leaders aren't behaving in a way that uh, is consistent with that, it's, it's not going to work. Or I haven't seen it work, put it that way. Well, I have to ask you, okay, since we're kind of talking this tension thing, we'll stay on just slightly here. As a consultant... As someone that comes in and helps an organization through these 14 steps, are you behind them pushing them up the hill? Or are you in front of them pulling them? What's your role as a consultant? Well, that, that's a great question. Um, actually, I, I would say have to use both ends of that equation from time to time. Sometimes you create dissatisfaction by sh- just showing them what's possible in other situations, right? And and they may think they're much better than they really are. 
And if you have examples of how other people have done it and performed much better, then you can create some dissatisfaction. That's often very useful and helpful for them and gives provides a good service. Now I have to tell you that, you know, there's you have to be ready for the conversation and the denial because when you tell somebody that if you use the dissatisfaction end of the scale and you tell them they're not as good as they think they are, what I've found is that uh, almost all humans go through some sort of cycle of they first deny that you know anything and have a clue, or they deny that those people are really producing that, or there's something unusual about that organization that gave, got those results. Um, if you stick to your guns and talk about it a while, eventually, eventually they'll, they'll say, okay, well, some of what you're saying is we can probably learn from, but the other part's still not that good. They'll try to bargain with you. And eventually, if you stick and hang in there, they, they might get angry. And um, and if they finally hang in there with you and you, you stick to your gun, they eventually are a little bit depressed about the whole thing because they've realized that they aren't as good as they thought they were. And, and it's only once they get past that and get to acceptance, they actually make progress and start moving forward. And And Many people will recognize that as Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's grieving cycle. And, and I, I guess what they're grieving is their former image of themselves is dead. <laughs> and they're, they're now grieving that and going through a process of, of denial and bargaining and anger and depression and finally acceptance. And the organizations that do this really well, they've learned to get through that cycle really fast because they know that they, they have got to get to the other side. I have to tell you, that's not a good sales pitch either. Telling people that they're going to experience all these negative things um, is probably not a, a great way to sell them on taking on this journey because the, in, you know, the interesting thing is the organizations that are highest performing, just, uh, just a side anecdote here, that, that the in, or organizations that are the highest performing have the most problems. And when I noticed this, I, I was like, this is really strange because the low performing organizations, they don't seem to have as many problems as the high performing organizations. And that just didn't make sense to me at all. And, and, I, and I thought about it, and I'm a slow learner sometimes, so I, I had to think about it. And, and when I thought about it, I thought, you know, it's not the number of problems that, that they have. That's not the variable I'm looking at. I'm looking at the number of problems they're willing to tell somebody about or they think they have. And what I found was the organizations that are low performing, they don't think they have many problems uh, because they don't really know what great performance looks like. And if they do know, they are denying they have problems. So they don't have many problems. And if you don't think you have many problems, well, guess what? You're not working on very many, improving very many things because you don't think you have problems. The high performing organizations, the more high performing they got, the more they understood about what was possible. And so they knew more and more about their organization and how imperfect it was as the more they learned. And so they became even more dissatisfied the more they learned and the, the further they went and the higher performing they were. But that was an essential ingredient to getting them to improve because you can't improve something that's not broken. And if they don't think it's broken, even though it is, if they don't think it's broken, they won't improve it. So um, that, I think the, the really high-performing organizations, they recognize, and, I, and um, Jim Collins, I think, called this the brutal facts of reality. They were able to face the brutal fact. I think that's what really we're seeing is the same thing that, that uh, Jim Collins saw in, his, in those organizations he studied, was that they were honest with themselves, and that enabled them to work the problem. Well, I think you go into that lean philosophy, though, if you – that they don't even call things solution. They call things countermeasures okay, because it's never really fixed. Okay, and you know, and if you don't see problems, that is a problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think you said that very well. I have to ask you just a really a last question here, okay? And I've taken so much of your time, but you know, you explain systems thinking so well. It's embedded in your process. I get a natural feeling that it's that the root of most of this and all this is systems thinking you seem to be practical about it which i compliment you on because i think most people when they go into systems thinking they're gonna you know you get off on some tangent is is that's why that may be not so popular i mean we all talk about it but not a, there's not a lot of systems thinking companies out there there's not a lot of you know that 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 concept seems very 
oh, I, I don't know the right word for it, but it's, 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 it always seems out there, okay? But it's not practical for most of us. And do you see that and kind of, can you summarize a little bit what I said in better terms, okay? <laughs> I don't I don't know if I can think of any better terms, Joe, but I but I but I've pondered this question of why um, it has been slow to be adopted or put into practice. And 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 I think there's uh, a few d different explanations that are probably all contributing to it. One of them is it's the way we teach people and bring them up. We we don't teach people about systems and to think in systems in school. Not in K through 12, we don't really. Uh, we teach individual courses with very little discussion and or exercises around integrating those courses together into a system. And, and we continue that in business schools for sure. I mean, I'm not sure about the, the engineering programs, but I know the business schools not only business schools are organized in silos the i mean so much so that the you know the marketing uh, people or the finance people or accountants they often will know uh, their colleagues around the world and their discipline better than they know their colleagues in another department down the hall it's just not a very integrated organization itself and neither is the curriculum for most business schools I, I mean, I'm sure there's some out there and there's some that are, are, are doing well at this, but most business schools, they train in the pieces and parts and the silos. They give specializations and degrees in the pieces and parts and silos. And most of them rely on one course called a strategy course to try to bring it all together. And by that point, it's usually too late in the curriculum. And, and then we send them to organizations and they create siloed functional organizations that and they don't look at it as systems and we wonder why well we trained them that way that's that so we get what we you know we get what we deserve i guess so i think that's one issue the other issue is just humans and the limitations of humans and the way we learn um, and other people have pointed this out um, all the way back i i think to jay forrester's work and deming's work and senge's work point out the the distance when the distance between cause and effect is is quite large and not immediate we have difficulty making the connection intellectually between cause and effect and and so you know when you're driving a car and you turn the wheel left a little bit and the car makes a change we learn pretty fast that turning the wheel makes the car move in that different direction so the learning loop is very fast in organization and other systems, it's not so fast. You have this delay built in between action and the result. Senge uses a few great examples like the aspirin. You know, you take an aspirin, it's, your headache doesn't go away immediately because there's a delay in the effect. Uh, same way with hot water and the tap and adjusting it. Well, when you talk about organizations, but you can magnify that issue a thousand times, I think, because not only do you have a delay in but you know the policy we create the change in a process whatever it is and the actual results that we're getting are often months later and they're out and the result is in a different process or a different place in the flow than it, the the cause is and so because of that difference i think it becomes very difficult for us to learn so we need really good and explicit models about our organization theories about how our organization works in order just to have the conversation. And you add into that all the external and internal factors that are impacting those results. We, we now have not good experiments. They're not controlled experiments. And so we often are, can't explain the results completely by what we did three months prior. And so, but there is hope. I, I, I see a little ray of hope on the horizon because this, the unfulfilled promise of big data and uh, the digital processes and how we measure them might help us take a few steps forward in system thinking because if we can come up with the right mental models and the right structures and a way to think about it, we can then guide the collection of the digital information that now would be much cheaper, uh, free almost and after you design it, to collect the data we need to actually analyze the system in a way that's more profound than we currently are doing it just to, uh, not to start a new topic, but I think part of what gets involved in this is, is Deming's system of profound knowledge where organizations are this, this combination of, you know, psychology and people systems and, and variation and statistics and understanding what variation looks like 
and that fourth component that he proposed, you have to have a theory of knowledge and, and to help you understand all that. Well, that's not easy stuff. And, uh, and I think that's part of what's, what's lagged behind. But I see hope that with these tools, a lot of times we just lack the information to even have the conversation uh, in any way that wasn't conceptual. So now with the data, we may be able to get grounded in data and facts and be able to really ferret out some of the ways these systems work that we haven't been able to do before. But we're going to have to create those models. Otherwise, big data is just a bunch of data. And, and I, I think has a, a, a great observation because just as you're talking there, I'm sitting there thinking, OK, we have all this past data that we're looking at and everything. And we all have that we can gather current data so quickly now. It's instantaneous. But what we, what big data, the promise of big data is now we got predictive analytics. We got predictive data. So that cause and effect we've got from we're, we're shrinking on all at to the present moment, right? That we get quick enough. That cause and effect is we've taken that delay and shrunk that delay a great deal with data. That if we can achieve that, big data will fulfill its promise. That, uh, but right now um, we we don't really I haven't seen too many people use the systems thinking structures to combine with big data to come out. There's a few that have, and, and there's some good examples, but that would have to become widespread. And, and if we can make our organization designs explicit, and by design, I mean the systems explicit, not just the hierarchy and structure, which is so much often what we think of with org design, but the actual, how the flows of information and value work in the organization. Um, I think we have a chance of really leveraging big data to, to make a big difference great conversation that, that has to wait for another podcast probably <laughs> okay <laughs> what's up coming for john latham well you know i'm on a bit of a bit of a um, i'm attempting to be on a bit of a sabbatical working on a book that goes into much greater depth on those two frameworks and the 14 steps and so what you see on the site we produ produce out a weekly article um, that explores different issues but this book I'm, I'm hoping really will provide people with uh, much more depth on the application and what it really means to organizations and how to do something with that information even further than what the current information does. And, and at the same time, working on um, e-course uh, to help people with worksheets that actually help them apply these concepts. And I can only fly to so many places and get around, so I've stopped doing that for the time being. And I'm focusing on uh, trying to reinvent the, how we get these ideas out to people and not reinvent but adopt really other practices that are digital and to where anybody with an internet connection and probably needs to speak English can get to the course and um, the book and learn these techniques. And so we're looking for ways to, to structure this course where it's not education as much as it is a workshop where they actually do applied work all the way through it and apply it to the organization. So more to come on that. But that's that's the that's what we see as the future and how to really help the most people we can. What's the best way for someone to connect up with you? Well the first, you know, the first way is organizationdesignstudio.com and there's several ways to connect with us there. You can, you know, there's a you can contact us through that site. There's several social media places where we've started uh, uh, putting stuff and we're trying we're going to attempt to build a conversation and a community out there in the social media but my my direct email is john at organization design studio.com so if you want to email me directly i i answer all my own mail i don't even have a virtual assistant that does that um so when when you hear back from me it's it's me it's and really you huh? it's really <laughs> it's really me. john at organization design studio.com is the email Okay. Well, I'd like to thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. Uh, this podcast will be available on Business 901 iTunes Store, the Business 901 website. So thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks, Joe.